We thank you very much. Thank you very much. We want to uh, we want to begin our program, and uh, even though R Representative Sam Farr isn't here yet, we know he's on route, and you know, traffic in Washington is unpredictable. But we I I want to reward you by starting on time or roughly on time because you came here on time, and so we want to do that. Thank you. My name is John Hamry. I'm uh, the president at CSIS, and uh, am very grateful that we have a chance to do this. Uh, I especially want to thank Aaron Williams, who's been patient with us. We've tried to schedule uh, an event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps for a long time, and I'm glad we can do it. And, and thank you very much, Aaron, you, you and your team. Um, let me just say, uh, first, a couple of words of introduction. I, I want to thank our friends from Chevron, who are making possible our opportunity to present to the Washington policy community, the crucial role that development makes. I mean, it's kind of a debate that's been lost in Washington, and it's kind of a rancorous debate in the, in, especially in the budget turmoil we have right now, and people are kind of not looking at the bigger picture. And this is an opportunity for us to present the bigger picture, and so I want to thank Chevron for that. Let me just share with you what, how personally I look at this, and that is, uh, you know, of course, it was 50 years ago when, when the Peace Corps was founded, and it was at the height of the Cold War. Now, I'm a defense guy. I spent 25 years of my professional life in the Defense Department, but I'd have to be honest to tell you, the Defense Department didn't win the Cold War. The Defense Department was an important part of our security. It was what made sure that the communist world didn't intimidate the West into adverse political circumstances. But we won the Cold War with superior ideas. We won the Cold War with ideas that the world wanted. We won the Cold War because we became champions of a worldview that saw the potential in individuals and in countries. That's what people wanted then to be a part of this. We won the Cold War because of these ideas and nothing is probably more at the core of that than was the Peace Corps if you just think about it. It embraces America's uh, uh, highest ambitions for everyone, and especially other people. What is the possibility of human life? And our responsibility to do something about that. And that's really what the Peace Corps was all about. It also grew out of this enormous reservoir of uh, 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 the American spirit that feels they need to live a bigger life than just their own comfort. You know, it's just, you put those things together, and it was a winning formula, and it created a marvelous institution. I can't tell you the number of times when I bump into people I really highly regard, and I find out in our conversation they were Peace Corps volunteers. It's just remarkable. It's what an incredible thing this has been for us. So uh, we need to celebrate this. Now, why do, why do you celebrate anniversaries? It's not to look backwards. It's to look forwards. It's to remind ourselves of what's important in our lives, what makes a difference, to bind ourselves together and to give ourselves new vision. That's why we celebrate anniversaries. And certainly no anniversary is more important to observe than that of the Peace Corps, a remarkable institution. Now we have to help us do this today uh, we've got uh, some remarkable individuals. Harris Wofford, uh, who was a senator uh, at a time I was just a young kid starting out in, in working in, up in the Congress. And so I only saw him as this very <laughs> elevated, r remote figure. And now I have a chance to meet him. You know, this is a wonderful thing for me. I'm really excited by this. And, of course, he served as the deputy director of the Peace Corps uh, for many years. And he's kept this passion in his heart for the role that the Peace Corps plays and can play to make such a difference. And so we're going to start by asking him to offer some framing observations. Then we're going to turn to two members of Congress who are, uh, I know them both uh, in, in, in very different ways. Tom Petrie, who is here, who's a very good friend. He's been, a, he's been in the Congress for 17 terms. This is a v remarkable thing. And I'm one of, the, one of the guys that celebrates seniority in Congress. I don't think rapid turnover is a good idea. 
in Congress. I think we want people that know, that are here, and know their government, and know the way the government works, and know the foundations of government activities, so that then they can do for us what we need to do, which is to provide really strategic guidance for the country. Not micromanagement, but strategic guidance. And I think that comes from a guy like, like Tom Petrie, who has been uh, a champion, especially a champion for things like the Peace Corps. Uh, he was in the Peace Corps, I believe, in Somalia. And, uh, and this was a, before he came into the Congress, and he has been a thoughtful champion throughout these years, and we're lucky to have him here. And then when Senator Sam Farr comes, and he'll join us here shortly, uh, Senator Farr, or Congressman Farr has, from California, uh, was a Peace Corps volunteer, I believe in Columbia, and he too has been an outspoken champion for the role that the Peace Corps plays. This positive, constructive role, America has to have this kind of a face in the world. The world is frankly always a little nervous about America because we're so big as an economy and we have a big military, they're nervous about us. But it's things like the Peace Corps that gives reassurance of the greater nature of America's character and content. And then finally, we're going to welcome Aaron Williams. And Aaron, uh, congratulations to you. You're doing such a fine job leading the Peace Corps. Aaron has been a leader within USAID for many years. And, uh, and he's now heading up the Peace Corps. Uh, and this is coming at a time when, as I said, Americans are turning inward. You know, we're turning inward. This recession is making us look inside. It's also sadly making us look small. And we have an opportunity again. Let's raise our pers perspective. Let's open up our horizons. This is what we did in the past. It's what we need to do in the future. So let me, let me turn. Uh, I think S S Senator Wofford is going to begin the program. Senator, I welcome you to the stage. Would you all please give a big round of applause for Senator Harris Wofford. Thank you, John. If you got a few more uh, decades uh, under your belt, uh, you'll be having somebody say that about you. He's, you know, he's still here. He's right here. Chris Matthews, um, in shamelessly and, and reasonably uh, selling his own book, Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, the Elusive Hero told a story in which I was involved, plus an African-American colleague, Louis Martin, and <clears throat> on his piece on uh, just right after Hardball with Al Sharpton, uh, Chris, Chris said, Louis Martin is no longer with us, and then he ended the whole thing. But Harris Wofford's still alive. <clears throat> so <laughs> I think, I think, I feel, I feel, I, I feel, I feel lucky to you, even though the, thought of the, uh, was it 17 terms? 17 terms of, of uh, Tom made me realize that Rick Santorum cut short my one term in the Senate. So uh, it doesn't mean that I'm wishing him well right now. But <laughs> We actually have worked together on Bono's uh, uh, Aid to Africa. And he Rick asked me to be co-chair of the Bono campaign in Pennsylvania as an odd couple and we went around um, the state um, saying that we disagreed on 90% of the important issues, but on 10% that were important, we agreed, and when there's 10%, uh, you ought to take, go through it. You ought to do something with it. And so, uh, in, in general, in life, I, I wish him well. Now, uh, the... the <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Now, I, uh, some of you have uh, heard me enough in the uh, 50th anniversary, so uh, mostly I want to use my 10 minutes to uh, deliver a little of John Kennedy and Sergeant Shriver and what they saw as the uh, spirit and the frame within which they saw it of, of the Peace Corps. By the way, John, I, you, you started with USAID's 50th anniversary here. Uh, being celebrated and thought about. And uh, our last event before this of the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps 
uh, was the White House's combination of the 50th anniversary of U.S. aid and the Peace Corps. And when we started the Peace Corps, there were, there were many people that felt we were um, polar opposite to U.S. aid. And they also were worried, we were worried uh, at a, a, a advice that uh, Kennedy's brainstorming group in MIT had given him, which um, he had initially supported President Kennedy that the Peace Corps should be a subunit of uh, the new U.S. aid organization about three levels down, a little box underneath the people power uh, box, people box. And uh, Shriver did his best to say the Peace Corps needed to be autonomous and uh, not part of that. Kennedy didn't support a powerful case that Sarge made when we, we, I was with him on the trip around the world to see if heads of state wanted to have the Peace Corps. And in New Delhi, we learned that Kennedy had upheld that recommendation and that we would be a little box uh, underneath the US aid program. And Lyndon Johnson, thanks to Bill Moyers, who uh, Lyndon was vice president, was chair of the Peace Corps New Advisory Council, went into Kennedy and said, you can't do that. You've got this wonderful new wine. You can't put it in that old bottle of the US aid program, which is probably the least popular program on Capitol Hill. You'd never know what it could have done. You're, you, this new wine needs to be in a new bottle. But I think it shows where the Peace Corps is now as part of America's relationship to the world related to economic development, education, uh, as always it has been, but that the partnership between USAID and the Peace Corps um, is crucial right now. And uh, the White House, uh, the president more or less uh, celebrated uh, more than an affair of the Peace Corps and USAID, but uh, a marriage, not under some little box, but um, a, a, a ma marriage of t uh, two very important agencies for the United States. Now, the Peace Corps uh, indeed was started uh, when the Cold War was in full swing. And uh, people have tried to put it primarily uh, in the context of the Cold War. Uh, Kennedy did not do so. Uh, Shriver never did so. Um, the Cold War was a fact. Shriver yearned for the day when the Peace Corps would be in China and in Russia, and that day didn't come in his time. It came in the other director's time of the Peace Corps. Um, Ted Ken Sorensen said that the Peace Corps was the one embodiment of the, the White House uh, words that are most famous for John Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It's, he said it's the one embodiment that Kennedy brought about. Um, but the Peace Corps, in Kennedy's view, was very much part of the other part of the inaugural address that began first proposition. The world is very different now for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And, and, and then uh, he says a little further on, to those peoples in the huts and villages across the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right to our sister republic south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds in a new alliance for progress to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. Finally, to those who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. And then uh, he said, um, all <coughs> If a beachhead of cooperation, uh, we
<laughs> preserved. Um, so my citizens of the world, ask not what America can will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Um, now, Sergeant Shriver, uh, I would recommend if you could get it uh, from Amazon, Sergeant Shriver's book, The Point of the Lance, um, written in 1964. It's his collection of his main speeches and papers, plus additional ones that were done for that book. Um, he, he said we, um, he, he was telling how in his report to the president on which the president acted, it stated the purpose. It can contribute to the development of critical countries and regions. It can promote international cooperation and goodwill. It can also contribute to the education of America and to a more intelligent American participation in the world. Uh, and um, he, he, he went on to say um, the, um, few juicy uh, points I wanted to read from this. Um, he quoted Arnold Toynbee saying, here is a movement whose express purpose is to overcome the disastrous barriers that have hitherto segregated the affluent Western minority of the human race from the majority of their fellow men and women. I believe in the Peace Corps, the non-Western majority of mankind is going to meet a sample of Western man at its best. He cited Dean Rusk as having said very early in the organizing of the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps is not an instrument of foreign policy because to make it so would rob it of its contribution to foreign policy. Um, to, to, to make some of that clear, Kennedy, very early and very strongly told this, by order told the CIA to keep hands off the Peace Corps. Um, Sergeant Shriver looking ahead, um, let me just say, um, here, Sergeant Shriver, um, what we are seeking is not the support of the newly developing nations of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as Kennedy would say. <laughs> we must be clear about our aim. What we are seeking is not the support of these nations, but their success. If they succeed in their plans for economic, social, and political progress, it will not matter whether they agree or disagree with us, even whether they like us. If they become healthy democratic societies in their own right, they will not be threats to world peace. So Shriver, looking ahead, um, said some specific steps to take to fulfill the Peace Corps. We can double the size of the Peace Corps. It was then at 10,000. The 10,000 strong Peace Corps now should be doubled so that at least 20,000 Americans can serve overseas in this effective new grass roots way. Uh, by the way, Vice President, uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey to the first return volunteers conference of a thousand of the first 3,000 volunteers in 1965 announced that by 1970 the Peace Corps would be 50,000 um, a year. Uh, when I went off to Ethiopia uh, as the representative of the Peace Corps in Africa and director of the large Ethiopia program, on the way back into the Oval Office, I, of the 600 on the White House lawn he was sending forth, 300 were going to Ethiopia to double the number of secondary school teachers in that country at a time their new university needed a greatly increased flow of high school graduates to, be a, to become a reality. Um, we were leaving very shortly in the end of the August 1962, and the way back in he said, you know this will be really serious when it's 100,000 a year. And then in one decade, uh, there will be, in one decade, there will be a million Americans with firsthand experience in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And, 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 and then, for the first time, we'll have a large constituency for a good foreign policy. Um, 
Kennedy, I, I submit, was right and he was wrong about um, the, the Peace Corps becoming serious. Uh, he already was taking it sufficiently serious to say the, fo the fo um, on size he said, um, who, who, who knows how many Peace Corps volunteers can, can go, but you know, let's move, the next step is to double it, and it was by then, in, when he left in 66, 16,000, and the next year it was to go to 25,000. So what a, a lost opportunity um, from one point of view, it, it has been that um, under the pressures of the Vietnam War, as resources got strained, to put it mildly, um, the Peace Corps uh, went back even under Johnson to maybe seven or 8,000 or maybe nine or 10,000. And under Nixon, it went down to 5,000. And uh, it gone from five to 8,000 now over all these other years, though Carter wanted to expand it when his mother was a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, Clinton wanted to double it. Um, the uh, George W. Bush after 9-11 called for the doubling of the Peace Corps. Um, uh, that side has never been fulfilled. But, um, but uh, Kennedy was wrong. If he had been with Aaron Williams and Chick and other uh, veterans of the Peace Corps here, uh, if he had been with us at the last day of the 50th anniversary as Five to 10,000, it's one of those things. Um, the conservatives say it was 5,000, and I even heard a tall leader of the Peace Corps the, last night say it was 10,000 that left Ar Arlington Cemetery. It was an endless march when you got to Lincoln Memorial across Link the, the Memorial Bridge and looked back as far as you could see people still coming down the hill and across uh, the, the Memorial Bridge to Lincoln's Memorial. Um, looking at that, uh, and the, that march of flags, 139 countries, uh, a couple of hundred of the Ethiopia veterans from, from all the decades were carrying the Ethiopian flag. Others here in the room were carrying or behind the flag of their own country. Uh, when you realize there are 200,000 stories um, of Americans whose lives were changed and how many hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, people overseas whose lives were changed for the better. Um, some of you may have heard the story of Paul Sangas, an Ethiopia volunteers in our first wave, um, who became a U.S. Senator and ran for president, as some of you may remember. Um, Paul tells how, I think it was a House Committee on African Affairs, he, had, he was with then Sam Farr, glad to see you too. Um, he, he uh, representing the Congressional Committee, uh, saw Mengistu, the dictator, but went back to his village, Gion Wiliso in Ethiopia, where he had organized this, the volunteer, the students he had been teaching and who were sleeping on the floor and walking for miles to school and had no electricity at night to study by. He organized a, a student corps to build a hostel with the help of the Swedish Building College, a wonderful hostel was built and we celebrated it and the emperor celebrated. Um, Paul went back to his village and the revolution had been devastating. The, he heard of the people who had been killed, teachers and and headmasters and others. Um, he could find nobody who had been there when he was there. No trace of the hostel. Uh, probably it had been torn down. Uh, it was just a vacant lot uh, with trash. And he went back, he said, sadder than he had ever been in his life. And he, he's very taciturn, strong, uh, cool, uh, wonderful guy. And at the bottom of his depression, there was a knock on the door, and he opened the door in Addis Ababa, and there were two of his favorite teachers. And they said, 
We heard on the radio that you were back and we've come 200 miles to tell you you were the best thing in our lives. Now a teacher in Chicago or Washington DC or Los Angeles or you name it, um, probably rarely gets that kind of moment. Paul said he had a bucket of tears coming out and uh, I get close to that each time I tell the story. But how many teachers um, in service in this country uh, get that moment when, when you uh, know that you had made a difference. And I think the 200,000 volunteers, and would it be 20,000 staff, um, all told, I think um, they had, whether they had it in the same form or not, they had that feeling that they made a difference, the Peace Corps has made a difference, and we should go on from there. Maybe in the discussion, I'll give you a few of the things that um, uh, Shriver was pointing to for what could um, um, be done as the next stage following the logic of the Peace Corps. And so I'm very glad that the center uh, is following the question where it leads, the great Socratic principle. And I, I think together we can put those questions forward and the center can play a very valuable and respected role in taking seriously uh, the seriousness of the Peace Corps. Thank you. program at CSIS and not a former volunteer but a dear friend of all Peace Corps volunteers who were part of a generation that uh, certainly framed what I think we call today smart power. And when I talked to Director Williams, this event had to be postponed uh, because of a vote at the end of 2011 and some of our representatives were unable to join us. I said, you know, we're actually today in 2012 starting the next 50 years and that this event in many ways, and thank you Senator Woodford, is a relaunch of the Peace Corps to look forward to see what we as a nation, as an agency working together can do with an institution that has been so much a part of many generations since the age of Kennedy. So I'd like to make just one brief announcement. Uh, we are in an age of tweeting and we will be live tweeting throughout this event. And there are many of you here that do it, and we'd like you to join the online conversation. I know our press person, Ryan Sickles, told me 500,000 volunteers just got a message. And if you would like to tweet, uh, the tweet is hashtag Peace Corps 50, and the information is also at the bottom of your handout. Uh, that'll be the end of the technological announcements, <laughs> but I think it's important. Can you hear? No. Okay. I'll try and talk louder. Is that a little better? And when they fix the sound, I will uh, moderate my voice. Well, as you know, on my right is Congressman Sam Farr, a Peace Corps volunteer from Colombia, Director Williams, Congressman Petri, who was a volunteer in Somalia, and of course, uh, Senator Wooford, who was basically the heart and soul of the uh, agency when it started. And not even a Peace Corps volunteer. I was the dirty word staff. I know, that's why I, did, I didn't want to mention that staff is not a nice word in Washington these days. I also wanted to acknowledge Chick Dombach, a former volunteer who uh, works with Congressman Garamonde, who unfortunately had a markup this morning, otherwise he would have joined us. But I know in spirit we have Chick here and that is excellent and so I just wanted to mention. We thank him and we'll have that on another occasion. But this is an opportunity to really both look back and look forward. And I have a few questions that I'd like to pose 
to the people who were volunteers, to the members of Congress who served. And that is, tell us a little bit about what was it like, Congressman, to be in Colombia at a time where a democratic country was opening up but was still very much a land of divided by the Andes and had a large challenge of urban and rural areas. Talk a little bit about your experience to us. Well, I don't think in 1964 we even knew what those words meant. Uh, well, that's why I'm a wonk in it. Thank we you. had Alliance for <laughs> Progress in Latin America. Uh, Kennedy was still, uh, it was right after his assassination. Harris Wofford was still very active in the Peace Corps. I was one of the first, I guess we were in Columbia 13, so it wasn't the first. But uh, when I went to training, nobody had yet come back from Peace Corps experience in Latin America, so nobody knew what it was really like. And I think for us volunteering, it was almost as if we were being treated as a very VIP uh, service in America, very exciting, new, challenging. And we, didn't, we were taught urban community development and cross-cultural sensitivity training, uh, those things we'd never heard of in college, mm -hmm. uh, and wondered why we were being trained that. Uh, but I think it was, without a doubt, the best uh, foundation for learning to be a listener and, in a foreign language uh, and really being able to understand what's broke that needs fixing in a cultural sense, not in an American value sense. As I remember in all this, and with this, is that Peace Corps kept telling us to listen to the felt needs. We were in urban community development, learning s the government teaching us Saul Alinsky, don't, te don't tell Newt Gingrich that uh, <laughs> we actually use Saul Alinsky as a community development <laughs> training program, but... Uh, you had to let that out, huh? <laughs> There goes the appropriate. The, uh, it, but what it was is to listening to the felt needs was, I remember people wanting to, I mean, it was a barrio without water, without lights, without schools, without everything. It was a really poor barrio. And uh, they said, you know, you're going to be hung up on health care needs. That's what Americans are always about. They're, and yet when people wanted their first project of people who had never organized, never been involved in a, in a neighborhood association, was let's build a soccer field. I thought, yeah, this is great to ask a gringo who doesn't never played soccer to come play and build a soccer <laughs> field for him. But I realized it was all about organization, just getting them together to, to organize that kind of first meeting and get a sense of community. Once that happened, we built schools, we built sewers, we built everything. We just took off. And it is taught me that if you want to change behavior, you've got to start with the basics, but you've got to start it on their terms and in their language. Thank you, uh, Congressman. What town were you in in Colombia? I was in a small town no one had ever heard of called Medellin, Colombia. <laughs> That's true. Not even, not even on the map. Very isolated. He was he was organizing the need of a lot of good I, organizing. I'm going to get to obscure. Right, very obscure place. But I'm going to get to you in a minute, Director Williams, because you also were a volunteer in Latin America. But let me go to the, uh, Congressman Petra. Since Africa was the other focus of uh, President Kennedy, and you served in Somalia, you had mentioned you were in a pre Peace Corps uh, project when we were talking before. Could you tell us a little bit about your mission and your service when you were in Somalia? Yeah, I, I uh, uh, had the opportunity before being in the Peace Corps well in college to participate in something called Operation Crossroads Africa that a, a Reverend James Robinson started. Uh, and the concept was for groups, so a very idealistic concept, of groups of 10 to 20 American college kids to go and work in one or another African country with a similar number of local students on projects in, in common. And I had the opportunity to do that in, in Kenya. Uh, and so I had some idea of the cultural challenges and opportunities that were presented by the, by the Peace Corps. Uh, I always came back home and say, that, you know, I, I was working on nation building in uh, Somalia. <laughs> now I'm working in the United States. I hope it turns out better. Uh, but but the, the, the truth is that uh, there, are, there are really two Somalias today. There's what was British Somalia in the north, which is really realistically, or really three, doing very well. And Hargeisa in that area is prospering. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the British uh, uh, legacy of the British Empire in that part of the world was actually quite positive. It was a very light hand. They really were a customer for the P 
people and many of the institutions and habits that they didn't really intend to but did inculcate are carry on and they've had elections and changed government a couple times peacefully and so on. Uh, in the south it's quite different, it's more of an Italian colony and um, so uh, you, <laughs> you run into all of that. But I, I, I think that uh, we sometimes don't realize, and John Hambry mentioned this, the, the power of uh, ideas and, and how, whether you're an American uh, Foreign Service officer or a Peace Corps volunteer or a, a, even a soldier, uh, you, people are watching you, little kids, saying either that's neat or that's terrible. But uh, while I was in, in uh, the Peace Corps, I took my vacation in, uh, Peace Corps vacation in Nepal, and uh, uh, Chester Bowles was the, ambas oh. was the ambassador in India at the time. And I can still remember wandering through the, uh, on a trek. It took a 10-day trek to Ogledunga from Kathmandu and back to my Peace Corps friends over there said, you really haven't been to Nepal if you don't go, get out into the villages and across the, the mountains. And I, if you're, you're American, you're six feet tall, and the <laughs> people in Nepal are about five or four or five or something. And so the windows, you can walk along and the houses are short and it's like visiting hobbits kind of. <laughs> you can, and you can look in people's windows. With, and I still remember wandering in some little village in the middle of nowhere, looking in the window, and there on their wall was a picture of John F. Kennedy. In the middle of nowhere. Uh, the ideas that, of, that, that Harrison spoke about were, had spread through modern communication and, and so on, to the most remotest par part of the world. And people were so eager to have an opportunity to, to uh, participate that, in that. In Mogadishu, some young Somalis came, came to see me. I was working uh, was a, with 50 teachers, Peace Corps volunteer Somali teachers, and two other Peace Corps, uh, we were supposedly legal advisors. I'd finished law school at that point. And uh, a couple of young Somalis came to me and asked if they could organize a Somali-American kind of friendship society. Uh, it turns out what they really wanted were uh, uh, um, American or other uh, movies in English <laughs> because they were from the British Somaliland in the north. And uh, the movies that were shown in Mogadishu were all in Italian in the local movie theater. And they didn't understand Italian. And they were saying, how in the world can we solve this problem? And the answer was if they could get the Americans to help import uh, uh, that culture. So uh, that's uh, just to say that uh, we are in some ways a vehicle. I, we were always taught when we were in the Peace Corps, we were representing the American people, not the American government. A very important distinction. Still are. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and that uh, we should, uh, uh, I, I think we, were, we ended up being an intermediary between the hunger that many people had and uh, to open themselves to bigger opportunities in the, in the world and that greater world that was on the outside. And on the other side, we, of course, learned a lot about the world and our own, own culture. So it's, it's, it's a huge investment. Peace Corps is a huge investment, in my opinion, opinion, that we're making in ourselves because we're broadening the cultural experience of a lot of young Americans, which will strengthen our b business, government, and other institutions, uh, as well as contributing to our understanding of the challenges that we face in dealing with different parts of the world. Thank you, Congressman, and I couldn't have asked you to set that up better because I have a question for Director Williams, and I think it comes out of the comments of Senator Woodward and John Hamry, and that is the, the agency has evolved. This isn't the John Kennedy agency. The challenges of the world we're living in are much greater. The kinds of questions our own nation is facing that Dr. Hamry referred to are important. And so I, I hope, including your talking about your experiences in the Dominican Republic, perhaps you can Tell us a little bit about how you see the Peace Corps being a part of our tools of foreign policy, and especially how in host nations that have our volunteers, how that helps become part of the social fabric and the relationship of the United States. Uh, thank you, Joanna, and it's wonderful to be on a panel with such great distinguished congressmen and also return Peace Corps volunteers who can continue to contribute to our world and to our nation. I think that, like Sam said, Tom said, the Peace Corps was, was transformational for me. 
it changed my entire perspective. It opened doors I didn't, that I didn't even know existed. It gave me an opportunity to have a career in business, government, and the nonprofit sector. All of that emanated from my Peace Corps experience. I left the South Side of Chicago thinking I was going to be a high school teacher for the rest of my life, and it opened up the entire world. Uh, the Dominican Republic was an interesting place in, in, in the early, in the mid 60s because, of course, there had been the invasion in the Johnson administration in 65. Uh, Dominicans, a large percentage of the population was anti American. And, but there was a very interesting difference between how they viewed Peace Corps volunteers and the rest, and the rest of the American government, per se. And so we benefited from that. We actually were enveloped by this, that warmth and that appreciation for Peace Corps because the volunteers had always stood with the people of the Dominican Republic, much to the consternation of the leadership of the Peace Corps at that point in time, who was concerned about volunteers not towing the line and, not, and actually uh, uh, making sure that they did represent America. But somehow, Peace Corps was able to walk that tightrope. And by the time I arrived in the Dominican Republic in, in 67, we still enjoyed tremendous, tremendous support. And so I had an opportunity to uh, work as a teacher trainer in the Dominican Republic. And as Tom mentioned, um, it was interesting because every, the home of every teacher that I worked with had two photographs on the wall. One was Jesus Christ, and the other was John <laughs> Kennedy. <laughs> Without fail. And I was also startled by that. I was saying, well, how did you get this picture of John Kennedy yeah. in your house? And of course, they cut it out of magazines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so immediately, we had this connection with the average Dominican. And they embraced us. You know, they, they fed us. They let us come into their homes and, and work with them. And of course, we learned 100,000 times more about ourselves and what we were going to be able to do in the world uh, through the, learning the language and the culture. Uh, connected with people at the grassroots level. We learned a lot more than we could ever have contributed. That's one of the great things today about Peace Corps, that we continue to build bridges between our country and the nations around the world and the developing world so that young Americans, in, in most cases, can develop the kind of perspective and leadership skills and understanding of, of the outside world. Because it seems to me, Johanna, that now in the 21st century, there is a tremendous need for us to do this, even more than it was in the past. Uh, and and to, to answer your last point, I think, that the difference now between the Peace Corps volunteers of our era and what I see today is technology. They still have the same passion, the desire. They're still beloved by their, their host countries. Uh, but the difference is technology. And they're not just using technology to, to Skype and, and tweet and text message to communicate with family and friends. They're using it in a very innovative way to improve the work we do in agriculture and education, teaching English as a second language, working on HIV, AIDS, prevention and awareness, working in trying to combat the scourge of malaria around the world. They're doing all of this in a very creative way. So I'm really proud of our volunteers of the day. As I tra I've traveled to 12 countries now in the last year and a half, two years, and it's been amazing to see these remarkable Americans and how much they're accomplishing. And uh, it's really it's quite gratifying. Thank you. Um, and you've also led into something that's very important. The Peace Corps has become an implementing partner with many government agencies, particularly yeah. USAID. Um, and it would be interesting to, to have our members of Congress also think about when you set priorities for foreign assistance, how the Peace Corps can figure in. You mentioned technology, literacy in the computer. These are tools that every young person around the globe needs in order to work. Uh, what are the gaps? What is needed to continue this kind of important partnership? And perhaps, uh, okay. Congressman, you have some. No, I can on that. speak from as being on the Appropriations Committee, not the subcommittee that deals with Peace Corps budget, but the big committee. And what I've seen over time is there's, there's two things lacking. First of all, it's just the commitment to really uh, embrace the Peace Corps financially. And everybody accepts it as a wonderful organization, no criticism. We love the Peace Corps. They love it so much that they don't help it, because mm -hmm. they don't think it needs help. Uh, it's, it, the, the help it needs is what Harris talked about uh, with the dream of Kennedy. And we have never had a president who has fought for the Peace Corps since Kennedy. And I was the first on my feet when George Bush said that he, uh, George W. Bush said he was going to double the size of the Peace Corps. We got a standing ovation in Congress. I made sure of that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yet, not, a, not any effort to putting the money in to getting it through OMB. We have never had a president that's been able to fight for the Peace Corps budget, uh, to take that leadership, including this one that included, said he would double the size of the Peace Corps, and hasn't done a damn thing to do that, other than hire a good advocate, for, 
inerrant. But the other fault is the U.S. Senate. The House marks whatever the Peace Corps, uh, we've marked it, uh, whatever, you can go back and look over the last 10 years, and whatever the House marks, the Senate cuts, regardless of whether it's Republican or Democratic uh, majorities over there. So we've got two problems to really get to the point of growing the Peace Corps, whether it's technologically or you know, uh, uh, with inner uh, cooperation. We've got to get the leadership to get some more money. It's embarrassing, embarrassing that in this era, with what's going on in the world, that the Peace Corps sits there with $375 million. The average Peace Corps volunteer makes $250 a month. It is the best investment in jobs in America. If this administration would think about putting the Peace Corps into the jobs bill, 20,000 Americans practically want to be in the Peace Corps. There are jobs for 20,000 people across. The demand is high from host countries. We're invited to be there. And yet we can't, uh, we can't appropriate enough money. It seems to me as we cut the Defense Department, we've got to increase the Peace Corps. Thank you. And I'm going to... <laughs> have to applaud that. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but Congressman Petri, uh, one thing that we discovered when we had an other event here, because it's also the 50th anniversary of USAID, is the kind of language that you mentioned, Congressman Farr, the consensus to increase civil participation around the world is there, and yet we can't build it. And I also like uh, Senator Wofford to, to chime in as a member of the Senate who supported the Peace Corps, to talk about what you think it would take. Would it take more return volunteers becoming a lobby force? Do you need a super PAC for the Peace Corps? Are there things? I'm, I'm not kidding. You know, maybe we could find a way, because these are investments in our future, but also in jobs, investment in youth, and also uh, American diplomacy in the best possible way. So I'm going to turn it over to you, who are the well, experts. Well, I, I, my observation is a little different, uh, because I think you, if you turn it around and look at it from the point of view of the country, not from our point of view, but from their point of view, and what you leave behind, and whether it's foreign aid or the Peace Corps, if we don't approach it uh, well, uh, we, and it happens over and over again that people have Paul Songus' experience, which is, where is that hospital I worked on, and what have we really left behind? And I may have touched two people, but have I done anything that really makes, a, 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 achieves a long-term objective? So I've really felt, especially with modern technology now, and I was struck uh, uh, two weeks ago visiting a Rotary Club in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, there was a young lady who just graduated from uh, University of Chicago, and not through the Peace Corps, but on her own, had gone over and taught at a school in Hargeisa. Uh, and the kids there were doing very, uh, when I was in the Peace Corps, there, there was a school run that a British gentleman had started called Shek, and it was on the Eaton model. A couple of Peace Corps volunteers taught there, uh, and and then they were followed by two other Peace Corps volunteers. So what I, I think it's important to try to, to uh, realize that in a lot of these places where we're operating, there is not the government framework and all the institutions we take for granted. And so when we plunk down, at, whether it's an aid project or uh, a Peace Corps volunteer, and then they go away, it disappears because there's no uh, sort of incentive structure in place, whether it's someone making money out of continuing to operate it or some other local institution that has some interest. So I really feel very strongly it's important to try to partner with other local institutions or uh, uh, organizations that are trying to do good in a different country so that the Peace Corps comes in but is just one, that's one person for a two-year period, but there's another one so it ends up being a teacher for 20 or 50 years, building I institutions, uh, and on that basis, a lot of other things will, con you'll get a multiplier effect that, that's positive, uh, instead of just a, an episodic individual experience or a, a episodic aid that's good for some American contractor, but the, when I was in Peace Corps, the, we, no, all the programs were almost, frankly, laughable because uh, uh, they, they would come in and drill wells and no one had any interest in really maintaining the well, a nomadic population. No one was put in place to sell for the water and protect the well. So people would take water and then move on and they would fill it in so the next tribe wouldn't get access to it. And it was really uh, 
you know, almost negative in terms of our long-term image and, and impact. Director Williams? Well, I want to uh, build on that idea of sustainability. I think the ultimate test of sustainability from the con in the context of the Peace Corps is the fact that we work at the grassroots level with local organizations. And that's ultimately what we can do. We're developing capacity within those organizations so that they can, in fact, work on their priorities and continue to work on their priorities and train the young people and the future leaders in any given country to sustain the development solutions that they come up with. That's number one. Number two, uh, one of my top priorities in the past few years has been to build up global partnerships with the leading international organizations that work in the field of development and also to reach out to our other uh, sister agencies within the federal government to work on, for example, PEPFAR in terms of HIV AIDS, to work with the President's Initiative on Malaria. Uh, we're now developing a strong partnership with USAID and Feed the Future in terms of uh, food security because I want Peace Corps volunteers to, number one, receive state-of-the-art training on the, in the key technical areas that we need to support in terms of these initiatives. Number two, to allow us to walk that last mile to strengthen the organizations that we work with in the countries and to build the capacity in the countries and use that as a, as a, as a lever for assuring sustainability long range. Because peace, we can never assure there's going to be another Peace Corps volunteer in the same place for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But we can assure that the people that we reach and touch receive the best possible technical training and, sustain, and sustainable support that we can provide by working with them and developing their own leadership. Thank you. And I wanted to turn to the senator to, uh, on the issue of the problems of bipartisanship and people giving standing ovations and then not adding the funds. What, what is your take on that? Well, my, <coughs> I'm uh, reflecting on the, <coughs> the case just made uh, about how do you measure whether you're helping other nations succeed, which was Shriver's test of what we're doing, um, when so many other factors, far larger than the Peace Corps, determine that. Uh, Ethiopia um, was an example where with 300 and in two years it went to 500 secondary teachers. Um, we did help them take a quantum leap in secondary and higher education in Ethiopia. Uh, we actually may have had a little bit to do with a terrible revolution because one of the, our great boasts about Ethiopia was that, as now is in another, uh, many places, uh, Peace Corps volunteers resulting in the local nations uh, forming their own volunteer systems. Uh, but in Ethiopia, the emperor and the head of the university uh, said, look, if people can come so, from so far, uh, foreigners from so far to help our poorest areas and our provincial areas, why shouldn't we require all university graduates in Ethiopia uh, to do at least a year of service in the provinces in education or health? It became a requirement. Um, hundreds and I guess thousands of Ethiopians, young men and women, went into areas that they had not been in before and saw poverty that some of them hadn't thought about before. And it, ra it radicalized many of them. And uh, they were a very, very uh, significant factor, the, the university students, uh, in the military being able to take over the country. And the military crazy ones, uh, the Derg, uh, then proceeded to try to kill um, any number, large number, of those university students who had been part of the revolution. So that's just one uh, you know, little country. The world is uh, different now, as Kennedy said in the first part of the inaugural address. Um, it's different in that there, there are probably not many countries left where you can talk about the Peace Corps doubling the number of secondary school teachers in the country. Um, in a sense, it's like Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's okay. Court, the way we talk about going into the empire of Ethiopia and making such a huge difference. We were so proud of the Ethiopian requirement of service. Uh, so you, you, know, you, have, you have to have either a tragic or a comic view of the world um, to, to measure what will happen. But my point is that Kennedy was right 
that both for the educating of Americans, which Shriver kept saying is what one of the things the world most needs is for Americans to understand the world better and to, to, to have a more informed world policy. Um, in, in addition, um, for, for that purpose, you lo need large numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, the 200,000 or the five or 10,000 that marched seem large. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the large forces in the world, Shriver w said in the part I, I, I didn't quote, now we must have on a large scale a reverse Peace Corps to America mm -hmm. where we invite, uh, I think he said, uh, to start with 10,000 uh, people from other countries to come and, in collaboration with the Peace Corps, come back here and teach in our schools mm -hmm. on a large scale. And uh, he, he, that's, he did a significant part of a chapter in his book on the reverse or exchange Peace Corps. It did get started in Shriver's day. Mm -hmm. Several hundred people came. An Ethiopia volunteer, Neil Boyer, ran it for some years. Congress got wind of, wind of it after two or three years. And the debate in Congress would have embarrassed us all. But uh, mm -hmm. both Democratic and Republicans, uh, uh, some of them, got up saying, what do foreigners have to teach us? And then a, another congressman got up and said, we already have too many anarchist social workers. Why should we import more <laughs> anarchist social workers? And Congress ruled that no more mon money could be spent with the Exchange Peace Corps. Um, but if you had Shriver today, he would say, you know, let's do brainstorming for what a 21st century Peace Corps should be. <clears throat> let's not assume that it's a monopoly of virtue. Uh, there's this whole gap of one year service that I keep looking at, the two years plus uh, is, is powerful. It's the special forces that do that much, but that's a long commitment. Some of the most skilled and dedicated Americans that would, would relish one year of service. Is it something the Peace Corps should do, or is it something that should a, a new uh, social invention should pr promote it? Uh, th that if we want to get to Kennedy's 100,000 a year, I don't having the first-hand experience, I don't think it is going to all be through the Peace Corps. Right. But volunteerism is something that was a basic pillar on which the Peace Corps was built. And I don't think we've lost that in America. I think, Congressman, you had your uh, well, hand up for a comment. Yeah, I, I think the best <laughs> market uh, <laughs> survey on the Peace Corps is, is the host country demand. Mm -hmm. It's always increasing. They want more, regardless of, of uh, uh, and you look at the example of Colombia, where we had to leave because of the violence created by the, by the uh, cartel. And the first thing Uribe did when things got, when peace is asked for the Peace Corps to come back. And we're in China, we're in Mexico, we're in countries you never expected us to be in. Uh, and, and those presidents come to this country and they're always asking our president, uh, send us more Peace Corps. The, the demand out there, the interest in it is, is, is extremely high. And I think also just, I, want, I was in, the first time I really got to know Dr. Henry is when I was invited as a member of Congress to be on a panel of uh, a committee that, that had been created by right. Congress right. to have CISIS study what can we do to stabilize country in post-conflict. And we had members of the Senate and the House and I really got active in participating on that committee and we came up with a report. And essentially the recommendations of the report were all the things that Peace Corps ends up doing. You got to learn the language of the host country. You got to learn the culture. You got to have the skill sets. Uh, you got to be able to go in and integrate. And we ended. This is for military purposes, mm -hmm. and for USAID and State mm -hmm. Department. And out of that, we created, thanks to Jack Murtha, because mm -hmm. the Congress and its its own bureaucratic silos would not create a new department in the State Department. But uh, we appropriated the money to do it, and uh, we we've got we've got the post conflict uh, reconstruction made up of USAID and State Department. And a lot of the people that are in there are, are returned Peace Corps volunteers who have those language skills and are working for these departments. I think that the world, the international community, the international development is moving in the direction the Peace Corps has always been. And we have uh, in Monterey, I represent the Monterey Institute of International Studies and the Naval Postgraduate School. And we have now officers in the Navy sitting down with returned Peace Corps volunteers who are getting master's degrees at the Monterey Institute and essentially what the military is asking is, how did you do it? 
How did you live in that village? How did you learn the language? How did you win the hearts and minds of the people? Because uh, they know in order to have stabilization, we're going to have to do that. So I think that that's why we have to, at this time, I mean, Harris, you remember Sergeant Schreiber always wondering, if we had grown the Peace Corps to 100,000 volunteers a year, and at the time the Peace Corps was started, look at the countries we were in. We were in Iran. We were in uh, Afghanistan. If we'd had that many volunteers being in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s in those countries, would we still have the problems we're having with those countries today? It's a very interesting thought. Now let me just add one thing, John, about sure. regarding what the congressman said about demand. Not a month goes by when I don't receive an ambassador from a country around the world or one of the American ambassadors to any given country, and they ask me one of three questions. When can you return to my country? When, how can you expand the Peace Corps program in the country? Or can you come for the first time? Every month. So the demand is unlimited. There's no doubt about that. No matter what size budget we have, we probably could never meet the demand for Peace Corps volunteers. The other thing in terms of the impact of Peace Corps in the international development community, as I travel to different uh, capitals and meet with the embassy teams there under any given ambassador, first of all, I find that more and more these days, the ambassador is a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Well, certainly his or her senior staff, many, many returned Peace Corps volunteers. Certainly in USAID, there are many high percentage of returned Peace Corps volunteers. We go out to the field to meet with the various development, uh, to see the various development projects, and you find the leading international organizations, their key people are returned Peace Corps volunteers. Their senior people, senior people in the governments that they work with, their counterparts, have been trained by Peace Corps volunteers in the past. It's an incredible network and incredible impact that the Peace Corps has had in Africa, Asia, Latin America. You see it every day to the extent that we never could have foreseen, I think, back in the beginning of the Peace Corps. Well, this multiplier effect mm -hmm. of return volunteers mm -hmm. also has an impact here in the United States. Mm -hmm. When you look at your website and you see the honor roll of people who have served and are continuing to serve our country, uh, it certainly is part of the larger project of trying to build a much more peaceful world. But let me, let me go back to something that uh, we said looking forward. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the private sector of learning from the Peace Corps as these projects in the private sector who go in uh, in the programs of corporate responsibility can learn from the Peace Corps. Could you describe some of the efforts that are being made to help? Because foreign direct investment is the engine of growth. It isn't our aid. Our aid helps, and it helps create the institutions. But tell us a little bit about what lessons you think the Peace Corps has looking forward to um, this kind of a model. In terms of partnerships with and Partnerships and with, with the private sector and how one can sustain what you teach to a volunteer. Well, I think, first of all, let's start at the baseline. When you talk to corporate leaders today, any significant global corporation, they want people who have the skills that Peace Corps volunteers develop during their service. You know, we, there's a couple of professors, uh, one at Rutgers, who started talking about using a term which I think is really appropriate for Peace Corps, and that's cultural agility. Mm -hmm. And I think Peace Corps volunteers certainly acquire cultural agility. They're able to understand the context, uh, speak a foreign language, uh, understand the cross-cultural uh, impact, and make a difference in, in very complex situations. So number one, global corporations are searching for people like that as we are in government uh, and, and in the nonprofit world. We're looking to, to partner with, with corporations that are interested in working with the Peace Corps. And as a matter of fact, we're also talking to USAID about perhaps a tripartite relationship where we could support those kinds of partnerships. But I can't think of a, a global corporation whose leadership I've spoken to who doesn't see the value of Peace Corps volunteers, who don't have many returned Peace Corps volunteers in their ranks already and want to continue to support it. Thank you. Well, we are in year 51, but you've had a very busy year. As we were talking uh, before this event, uh, you said you started last year on a plane, and uh, you've been to all over the world, as are many of the uh, people sitting with me on this panel. Uh, perhaps let's go um, among all of you. What are the takeaway lessons from these 50 years that you think will help not only build the, the support, but also change some of the, need, the needs or approaches to needs that you find in the countries that you're working in? 
we're, an, we're a small global community because of Twitter, because of Facebook. How do these new technologies leapfrog some of the changes that uh, are needed and support that? But perhaps you could share your experience as Congressman. Well, there's an old business adage that says if you want to s uh, buy something, all you need is money. <laughs> if you want to sell something, you have to speak the language of the buyer. It seems to me if we want to sell the concepts of democracy and human rights and, and all the things that we so proudly ex uh, support in the United States, then we better learn the language of the buyers who we're trying to sell this to. Whether and, and I think that the takeaway is that there is no better method of learning languages and culture. And I don't just mean the overall culture, I mean those, that village culture, that village dialect. Uh, you should see the shock of cab drivers in Washington when a returned Peace Corps volunteer gets in that cab and ha happens to be from that country and perhaps from that village. <laughs> Let me just tell you one story. I, I always ask cab drivers where they're from. And I was in Virginia getting a long ride back, and I cab driver said he was from Ghana. And I said, do you know Ghana is the first country the Peace Corps ever went into? And he said, you know Peace Corps? And I said, yes, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Latin America. And he says, can I say something to you? And he pulls his cab over, and he said, I'm here because of Peace Corps volunteer. My son, an American citizen, is graduating from the university this year. He's been accepted to medical school, but I tell him he can't go to medical school until he goes to Peace Corps. Good <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I think Peace Corps has unlimited, unlimited uh, experiences of how do you go into the next century. You got to learn the host country language and culture. Well, Congressman. Have you had a similar cab ride? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I do think uh, uh, the opportunities and the need for uh, developing this capability within our society for our own interest is very, very important. And I, I, in that connection, I involved in a lot of, as we are in Congress, a lot of exchanges. And I know one of the major initiatives of the current Japanese ambassador, they're turning inward too. and they're ability to uh, uh, know English and uh, uh, interact in other cultures is they feel declining. So they're trying to figure out what kind of a big initiative they can do to, to uh, uh, open up a new generation of Japanese uh, future leaders to the world, not, not necessarily to help the rest of the world, but to, so that they can survive better. And I think there is a lesson there. I can't, couldn't help but be at a chuckle reading the paper yesterday about the new head of China incoming, uh, who's going to visit uh, President Barack Obama, and then he's going to Muscatine, Iowa. And what? To, to Muscatine, Iowa, to stay with a, a family that he lived in, in the, their kids were off in college, and this uh, family hosted him when he was an exchange, on an exchange visit he was a young administrator in a pig growing part of China, so they linked him up with Muscatine, Iowa, where I guess there are a few pigs grown nearby. And he's, he uh, had his first trip outside the United States. Uh, now he's going to be the head of China. This is a very important thing. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Jacques Chirac, president of, uh, of France. And he, oh yes, well, I still remember. Uh, uh, my wonderful summer in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working for Howard Johnson, selling ice cream, 57 flavors. <laughs> and, and he went on and on about all of this. Well, this sticks with people, and it colors how they think about another, another country. And the Peace Corps volunteers do that in the villages that they serve and in another country, as do all of us. But it's, it's also uh, that, that we, we uh, uh, leave a big imprint uh, uh, of, of what we hope the best size of our culture with these sort of interactions, and not just a tourist visit, but where it's, you're actually dealing with, with foreign people more, more, more on a deeper mm -hmm. basis. And, you know, I'd like to call attention uh, to those that don't know about it, to, uh, to the report, a Call to Peace, uh, the Peace Corps at 50, uh, that included a very extensive Peter Hart survey 
of a large uh, sample of Peace Corps volunteers of all uh, decades. And it also includes, the, the, the survey is itself interesting, and it includes a whole series of uh, potential rev recommendations on how you'd apply the Peace Corps experience to new steps. Um, I think one of the things that we all agree on and that the return volunteers overwhelmingly s said was that the experience of education in action through mm -hmm. service and work, um, mm -hmm. that experience, the, the, the relationship of the Peace Corps volunteer to the country is a very big lesson to figure out uh, how to expand not only in this country but other countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have a huge number of foreign students in this country. Uh, study abroad goes both ways. But by and large, most of that study is academic, which is good. I'm not against it. Um, uh, in fact, I'm for it. But think, think of what if uh, the same numbers or the same number of people that go to study abroad had as an integral part of the study abroad, a semester or a year of actually working and serving in the society rather than uh, classroom education. And I think the Peace Corps' example of the power of education in action and in, through service uh, is a lesson for American education, but it's a lesson for any other country. Uh, China wants. Uh, I'm just reading 10,000 more English teachers um, to be just a small part of the number of English teachers they need for China's desire to learn English more. Uh, whether it's the Peace Corps or China paying for them to come it themselves, um, yes, but we need some Chinese to help us learn Chinese from native language speakers. And, I think the Peace Corps should be in the mix of figuring out how world education can, uh, can, can help prepare Americans to be citizens of the world. You know, John, that reminds me, just quickly, I was in Tanzania to celebrate and commemorate our 50th anniversary a few months ago. Tanzania was the second country that Kennedy and Shriver sent volunteers to. So I met with the president of Tanzania, and the first thing he wanted to tell me was about his Peace Corps volunteer teacher who had taught him in high school and how important that had been to his life. And he said, that's why as we expand, rapidly expand the number of schools in Tanzania to reach the most remote populations to make sure that children in rural areas have a chance to attain their high school diploma, we need Peace Corps volunteers today to teach math and science so they can complete their coursework and have the opportunity to go into college. This is today, 2012, in Tanzania. And this story is repeated over and over and again. Paraguay know. story is a good one, too. That's right. Yeah. Par well, President of Paraguay was. Same type of issue. But I think uh, before we open this up, I'd like to just mm -hmm. ask you, if there were a memo you were to write to the Congress about what the future needs were, all of you have articulated different issues, from English teachers to science and technologies, aside from the basic resources, which we've all mm -hmm. talked about and may be difficult, how do we use this successful model that has both promoted United States abroad in a very effective way and also taught Americans about other countries? What are the things that we need? What are the issues? Do we need, I'm a baby boomer. Do we need more of me going abroad and teaching English in retirement? Are there people that can benefit? There are a lot of lessons here. What are the things that you on your wish list would like to have? This is a memo to the Congress. Yes. <laughs> That's good. You have, you, you have he doesn't need a memo, just pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the beauties of a think tank. See? It is. That's right. They give you the opportunity to, to paint on this blank canvas. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my <laughs> humble memo to Congress would be that we need to capture the spirit and the imagination of America. We need to capture that in terms of our young people who want to serve. They have responded to President Obama's call to service, both domestic and international. And we need to bring in the baby boomers and people, 50 plus as we call it, in the Peace Corps also, because they have a tremendous amount to contribute. And in order to do that, we need the resources to be able to build the systems and, and provide the roads so that people can serve. That's what we, we need, resources, because the American people want to serve. 
And we have opportunities where they can serve, and we have, we have unlimited demand in the countries around the world. What we need to do is have the resources so we can make that connection. That would be the first paragraph of my memo. And paragraph two? <laughs> oh, I won't put you on A the billion spot. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> He'll write the second paragraph. <laughs> well, well, I think it's uh, serious. You, I mean, we we have it right now. The demand is there. Just think, there's twenty thousand Americans mm -hmm. applying for jobs. There's only four thousand jobs. That's one in five that can get in. And I would submit that almost every one of them is qualified. That's just that's just tragic. You make a promise and we can't deliver it because Congress hasn't put in enough money. The so president hasn't asked for enough money. It goes both ways. We've got to get, we've got to drill down and really get the money there to do this. And we can build all the partnerships and expand. I think the most, when uh, Mike Codell's, and I always try to meet with Peace Corps volunteers, I met with the Peace Corps volunteers in Paraguay. And these young volunteers said, yeah, I was a paratrooper in Afghanistan. He said, learning and seeing the poverty in Afghanistan, he said, I realized when I got out of the military, I was going into the Peace Corps. And he said, this is better training than I got in the military. And he had, I mean, he's special forces. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm just frustrated that, that Congress hasn't lived up to it under, you know, all the presidents have talked about growing the Peace Corps, but haven't yet put the, the spin on it to really get it done. Congressman, do you have any thoughts to add to this memo of the director? Uh, no, I was just sitting here actually thinking that uh, given the change in global uh, technology and all of that globalization, that there may be some, and there's huge demand in countries like China or Latin America or other places. China is actually an example where, as you, you mentioned, they probably are I think there are a lot of young Americans. I always Peace Corps is a great vehicle, but basically you can go on the internet and look, and you can probably find uh, people looking for someone with English skills in Japan or in China or uh, a lot of other countries in the world, and you can, if you can afford to go over there. You don't. You don't. So there may be some opportunity to to do some kind of a Peace Corps Mark II. I mean the regular full-time, full-supported volunteer, but there may be some opportunity to either through Peace Corps or some other organization to help people link up uh, on an international yeah. basis between where the demand is and where the opportunity is, rather than saying, well, we need infinite resources. We're never going to, I mean, it's, the world is such that people, there's always going to be competition for resources, but there may be an opportunity to close that gap or to help close that gap uh, through making uh, the uh, to to the person who wants to serve and the need uh, linked up and provide some framework the way eBay does for uh, uh, mm -hmm. people who want to sell goods and buy goods. So there may be some opportunities to to uh, help meet these needs, but doing it in a less I shouldn't say bureaucratic but traditional fashion. Well, we certainly could use the tools of technology. Somebody recently said on a trip to Southeast Asia that bad English is the language of business. And it's better to have <laughs> good English and to be able to have some kinds of exchanges. So if we could find a way to uh, use volunteers and to use the uh, technology we have, that would certainly help. But I don't think it answers the bigger question. I'd like to ask, uh, we, don't, we have about five minutes left. If, uh, we have lots of return volunteers and lots of questions. And I'd love to open this up to some people. So Can I just ask a question uh, first? How many, I want to find out how many return um, Peace Corps volunteers are here. Can you just raise your hand? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we loaded the deck, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> and we also have a former director of the Peace Corps, Mark Schneider, over there. I don't know if there's an uh, 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 Mark. <laughs> who is also a return Peace Corps volunteer. Thank Good you. to see you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Um, a lady uh, in, in the back, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. And could you say your name so people, and where you served if you are a return volunteer? Hi, I'm Sophie Keller, and I'm a freshman at American University. And I want to know, first of all, thank you for being here. And um, I would like to say that I think that having the reverse Peace Corps is a really fantastic idea and giving opportunity for students to learn from other students. 
And I want to know what can students do and what can I do to help promote the Peace Corps and convince Congress to fund these awards. I think that uh, one thing you can do is continue to be engaged as you are today in these kinds of forums where you can learn about the outside world, uh, the connecting points between America and the outside world, and talk to your fellow students and, and, and professors about the importance of international engagement. Uh, we rely on universities as our lifeblood because the Peace Corps started at universities with Kennedy's great speech at the University of Michigan. And today we have strong partnerships with the universities across the country. Uh, and they provide the recruits for the Peace Corps. And they also provide faculty, often become, sometimes become staff members. So remain engaged and make sure the international engagement, global engagement, is a part of the curriculum at your university and that you try to encourage those professors that are in the forefront of that. And you, you have a Peace Corps, you have a member of Congress representing your hometown. You go to that member of Congress and you tell them you want to be in the Peace Corps, but you understand they don't have enough money to put you in. <laughs> and um, I'm going to recognize people in a minute, but you just gave me a good opening to mention that CSIS has started a very interesting series of careers and development, which is part of this project that is supporting this forum, the U.S. Leadership uh, Project on U.S. Leadership, and. Um, if Piedra Lightfoot raises her hand, if she's down here, um, you can sign up for this uh, series. But in addition to the Peace Corps, which is a wonderful route, there are many other opportunities. And we want you to know f uh, that you can come to CSIS for those courses. Let me recognize another person here. This gentleman in the second row, please, if we can get a microphone here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Taspai Yilma Sabo. I'm the deputy head of mission of the Ethiopian Embassy. Uh, I thank the panel, and particularly Senator Wafford, for bringing out the history of Peace Corps in Ethiopia. Uh, some aspect of it was not uh, clear to me before. So I thank you for that. Two, we have had a function at our embassy in, in September. Uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of uh, Peace Corps volunteers in Ethiopia. And we had a wonderful occasion at that time. Uh, the number three point is that the Peace Corps volunteers who served in Ethiopia before are the best resources of our embassy today. Oh. So they are helping sure. us uh, connect schools, universities, and cities, twinning cities. So it's not just in Ethiopia that they were helpful. But here in, Ethiopia, here in the US, they are the best resources that we have, uh, for our embassy at least, for my line of business. Uh, and, and, uh, and I have traced a lady who, who taught in my high school to Colorado, Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. 35 years ago. And she's uh, one of my best friends. And she's helping us link universities between Ethiopia and the US. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, he's Deputy Chief of Mission uh, uh, from uh, Addis Ababa, okay. and his teacher this lady, years ago yeah, was a yeah. Peace Corps volunteer and one of his Can best friends. Can we get a microphone on the right Colorado. side? And the Peace Corps volunteers in this country are one of the biggest resources mm -hmm. that the Ethiopian Embassy has in being effective. Excuse me, Hi, I'm Thelma Ask. Yeah, I'm a senior advisor at CSIS, but I have a question for Mr. Williams. Uh, actually, following up a bit on, on uh, uh, Ms. P uh, Congressman Petrie's uh, uh, points, and that is how to put more uh, uh, Peace Corps boots on the ground mm -hmm. in a time of dwindling resources. Mm -hmm. And could you talk a little bit about the collaboration with uh, the academic world mm -hmm. and also with the private sector? Uh, is, it, is there an, uh, an effort underway, or could there be an effort <coughs> underway to um, basically increase the, the sponsorship of universities uh, and include it in their curriculum and matriculation rules, mm -hmm. as well as sponsorship by the private sector, who certainly would view a Peace Corps stint as a positive on a resume, mm -hmm. uh, but can the they actually program. sponsor uh, Peace Corps efforts, uh, individuals, mm -hmm. particularly in the high tech and math and science uh, sector, uh, 
uh, which would actually increase the number of Peace Corps volunteers on the ground. Thank you for that question. We have a very strong partnership with the universities across the country. We have two types of partnerships. First of all, we have something called Masters International with about 70 universities in the United States. That's where you apply to the university and the Peace Corps on parallel tracks. You're admitted to both. You do your coursework in your first year for your Masters, then you go overseas and complete your two-year Peace Corps service. Then you return, you use that service as a basis for your final thesis or project to get your Masters degree. It's a great recruitment tool for Peace Corps. We sign up a new university or college just about every month, and it's a really important part of our partnership. I was just out at the University of Denver and the University of Colorado uh, last week to, to, uh, for a Peace Corps uh, recruitment event. As a matter of fact, the dean of the Corbell School, University of Denver, is Ambassador Chris Hill, who's also a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Most recently, he was our ambassador in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. The second program is something called the uh, Peace Corps Fellows Program, the Coverdale Fel Fellows Program whereby when you return from the Peace Corps, uh, about 70, again, 70 universities and colleges offer fellowships to Peace Corps volunteers uh, to get their graduate degrees there. And why is that? Well, it's because if you talk to any, any dean or any president of any university, returned Peace Corps volunteers are tremendous graduate students. They enrich the dialogue within their classes, with their professors, they make a difference. And so that's a very, very important partnership. In terms of the private sector, we are talking to a number of global corporations about uh, enhancement of their internships and their support of Peace Corps because they value that, that in the experience of a Peace Corps volunteer. So we're looking at ways to, to expand that. Thank you. Let's take a, a round of questions because we're running out of time and then we'll uh, open it up to the panel. Uh, this lady in the first row, please, mm -hmm. and then I'll take a few more and then we'll sure. close out the session. Hi, um, I'm Liz Fanning. I'm RPCV from Morocco, and I had the Sergeant Shriver Scholarship, too, for graduate school when I first got back. Um, I recently started a nonprofit called Core Africa to bring the Peace Corps experience to African countries, like uh, AmeriCorps for African countries. Um, and I know that the African Union is also starting a, they call it an African Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you uh, support them in any way, um, see it as a true, uh, what is it, imitation is the biggest form of flattery if you take credit for what they're trying to do and work with them. Can you support us in any way? <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. You know, I had not heard about the African Union's uh, initiative on volunteers. I'd like to learn more about it. Maybe we can talk about it offline to later on today. Uh, that would be very interesting. We find more and more countries around the world are interested in volunteerism, and they, would, they naturally turn to our offices in the various countries where we serve to ask us about how we can support that. And uh, it's something that we believe is important. We, we see it as kind of another goal of the Peace Corps to encourage and promote volunteerism in the countries where we serve. I think it's a marvelous way for young people to contribute to their societies. Thank you. That core Africa uh, that Liz Fanning is mm -hmm. trying to move forward is mm -hmm. one of the most creative new approaches. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd urge those of you who uh, find it interesting to mm -hmm. try to talk to Liz Fanning. She's, she's a social innovator of uh, the first magnitude now. <laughs> That's an very <laughs> astute decision. <laughs> it's a setup. Um, let, in a matter of time, we have a question here, uh, one in the back and one over here, and a lady in the back has been very patient. Let's try and get this gentleman in the second row here. Stand up so the person with the microphone can get it to you. Thank you very, thank you very much. My name is Mark Dietz, and I'm a former volunteer from Armenia, now working here at CSIS. And I'm just wondering if you think the debate about what it means to be a volunteer needs to change. When I flew back from Armenia to Chicago, I was waiting in line uh, to check my passport, and I saw in flashing lights an expedited, uh, expedited line for servicemen, which I think is certainly something of, of, of worth. But I, I just wonder, do you think that we can ever equal a volunteer with a soldier in terms of the national service debate? Thank you. Good question. Uh, this gentleman in the middle here, and then I see another gentleman who had a question. I'm John Keaton. I was a volunteer in Thailand, but I briefly want to mention two other countries. I learned today that Peace Corps is going back to Nepal. That's correct. When they get there, they will find Korean volunteers. Mm -hmm. And Korea, where I was a director in the 70s, has modeled its program on the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And there are approximately 3,000 Korean volunteers now working just like Peace Corps volunteers. And they will welcome the Peace Corps back to Nepal. But 
in recent years, I've been in Afghanistan. And that's a different lesson. And I truly believe that we would be winning the war in Afghanistan <coughs> if America had applied the goals of Peace Corps, the sensitivity of Peace Corps, caring, listening, learning. <coughs> Our people in official capacities are fearful of Afghans. We've lost the Afghans because we did not care for them like Peace Corps volunteers would have. It's a tragedy. An AID director told me not too long ago he had been in Kabul for nine months and had never left the compound except in an ambassadorial convoy. We must overcome the conundrum of the security concerns by caring for the people. We have lost Afghanistan because we did not know the lessons of Peace Corps. Right, well, thank you for that comment about Korea because uh, we have, they have reached out to us, the Korean Peace Corps, if you will, and we're engaged in conversations about some joint ventures, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a wonderful development. As a matter of fact, the government of Korea paid for all of the returned volunteers that they could find who had served in Korea to return to Korea. I might also say that issue of the compound is happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. As I go on these Codell's congressional delegations to other countries, I'm just shocked at how insular <laughs> we're becoming uh, and how we're losing that. I mean, in the Bogota Embassy, which is the largest mm -hmm. in Latin America, the American employees get special housing, and they are driven to work in secured uh, vehicles. Their co counterparts working in the same office, the Colombian host country nationals, ride to work on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the image of you know, ugly America. And we, are, we have got to break that image by getting back and winning the hearts and minds, living with the people. Yeah. I have one, one thing to underline what you said about uh, uh, Afghanistan, and that is that I think it, that's actually an American cultural weakness rather than a, a, a classmate of mine in college joined the Foreign Service. His first assignment was Afghanistan. And he sent pictures, which was sort of a joke, of the, this is in, in the 19, uh, mid early 1960s, of the, of the Kabul Country Club, which w involved goats and rocks. But the British uh, had uh, organized, they put nine poles out and they'd go out and, and hit a ball uh, among the goats and have a couple drinks afterward and it was something to do in Kabul at the time. Uh, I was there on one of these Codells meeting a guy from our embassy and I told him that story and he said, oh, it still exists. I was invited to go play the golf there on uh, Saturday by a couple of Brits. I said, well, are you going? He said, no, they don't let me go because of security. I said, well, how, how can anyone tell the difference between the Brits and an American when you're you know, at the other end of a rifle some way away. He said, I, no, I don't know, but uh, they have a higher tolerance for risk than we do. Uh, so, you know, I don't think they would probably figure it's that sporting to shoot a couple of guys with, who don't have guns but just have uh, golf clubs in their hands. And we, we kind of don't understand the psychology of trying to work with people, and there are risks involved, but you pay a price when you just isolate yourself. You may, you may survive, but you don't win the battle that you're trying to do. I, there was a patient lady in the back. I'm going to let her answer the question. And then we have to close out this session. But please, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mariko Schmitz. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Vanuatu. And I currently work for the Japan International Cooperation Agency, which runs the Japanese volunteers. And I would like to know what recommendations you have as a government institution to leverage domestic support for foreign assistance. Well, we have a number of tremendous partners, domestic partners in the United States, um, who support the Peace Corps mission, help us in our recruitment, especially they're helping us in terms of reaching out to the diverse population in America so that, so that the Peace Corps can reflect the diversity and richness of America. Um, and we, can, we want to continue to do that because it's important to have this domestic constituency, if you will, and it also allows Peace Corps volunteers to return from their service and continue to serve through various uh, and sundry means in the NGO community in America. 
Well, we have had a wonderful conversation. Are there any other last closing words? We've had so many questions that we could probably stay here all day, but I think our room has other uses and you have another job. But if you'd like to. Let me just say one final thing in terms of Peace Corps. Um, you know, as I travel around the world, I see lots of different volunteer organizations. Uh, the, the Nordic countries have volunteer corps, the Japanese have a fine corps, Korea has a fine corps. But nowhere do I see a volunteer corps that has the breadth and the scope of the United States Peace Corps. Today, 50 years later, we continue to be the gold standard for international volunteer service in terms of the breadth of our technical e expertise, the commitment of our volunteers, the fact that they work at the, at the very grassroots level with communities and organizations around the world. It's a great testimony to the service of 200,000 Americans who have gone before us, the ones who are currently serving, and the incredible partnership we have developed with countries around the world. It's a great testimony to Americans and the Peace Corps and the great partner countries they have. So I think that's, that's certainly worthy of a 50-year celebration. Thank you. It's this is election year, and if you want, you have the power of electing uh, the, the next Congress and the next President of the United States, and you ought not to give that vote unless they promise to double the size of the Peace Corps. And you ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have certainly had the most interesting of conversations to launch the next 50 years. Thank you all for coming to CSIS and joining us with Director William, Congressman Farr, Congressman Pete Fry, Senator Wolford. Uh, please give them a hand for their time and their dedication. <laughs> uh, Tom, did you uh, have a copy of this? Jan?